Right, good morning um, for the second session today. Um, just to introduce you to Mike. Uh, Mike is a member of the IMS. Um, he's worked on, um, he's a workboat and yachts there um, in the USA and Europe since 2000. Uh, since 2012, Mike has worked in the wind farm sector, which is a very fast growing sector for the industry at the moment, versus crew transfer vessel, uh, master for sea cap services, and more recently as operations manager for offshore turbine services. Mike has also been involved in developing severe education programs with the IMS and MyTech Boat Building College, including the BTEC PhD in the Royal Savannah. Yeah. That that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good morning, everyone. Um, just to give you a little bit more of my background, um, I was uh, an active surveyor up until 2012, and I, I made a sort of conscious decision that I was interested in getting into superintendency and vessel operations uh, more than and move away from surveying. Um, what I did at that point is I, I sort of moved off into the offshore sector and the offshore uh, wind sector. Um, I, I do actually still do some uh, private independent surveys for private clients that I have previously. Um, so what I'm hoping to give you today is a bit of perspective from an operator's point of view, because obviously as an ops manager or a superintendent in the wind farm industry, you spend most of your time dealing with surveyors, flag state, port state, um, and obviously it's quite an international uh, industry. So uh, that might be in the UK or it might be further afield. Um, so I'm trying to give you a perspective of uh, how we see the, uh, the relationship with the surveyor, but also just how complicated the modern wind farm industry uh, is. As my specialty is in small craft under 24 meters, I apologize to the large uh, vessel surveyors in the room. I'm not going to try and explain what goes on in the big ship world in the wind farm industry. I will sort of give some highlights of some of the vessels involved. Um, but to be honest, the way the complexity of the survey regime of small craft is going, um, the two sort of vessel sizes are almost just going to meet in the middle at some point in that uh, a sub-24 meter vessel goes through almost as many surveys um, and inspections as a large ship does working on wind farm. Uh, some of that's client driven, some of that's uh, port state driven. So uh, I'll give you a little bit more of a taste of the industry. Um, as you heard in the news yesterday, totally coincidentally, um, there's obviously been a lot of hoopla about driving down costs in the, uh, in the production of uh, offshore winds. At the moment, um, to just give you a feel of the industry in the UK, um, because the UK is the, the world leader in offshore wind, uh, we've got 30 offshore wind farms operating in the UK at the moment. Um, that's rather meaningless because a wind farm might be two turbines, it might be 175 turbines. What's of more interest to us really is the capacity, we're at 5 gigawatts, again a largely meaningless number, it actually represents about 5% of UK electricity consumption at the moment. So as an average, uh, with offshore wind, this is not onshore wind, offshore wind produces about 5% of the UK's electricity. Of more interest to vessel operators and equally to surveyors is how many turbines there are. So at the moment in the UK there's about 1,500 turbines. Um, and of course at the moment, generally speaking, each turbine's got three blades, we've got 4,500 blades. The reason that figure's of great interest to everyone in the industry is the blades are not holding up the way they were expected to. They're largely composite, either uh, FRP or carbon uh, composite blades, and they're suffering a lot more from uh, degradation due to the salt than onshore blades have ever suffered from. Even onshore blades that were close to the sea and not don't suffer in the same way. The thing is very interesting because a lot of vessels in the offshore uh, wind sector now are involved in repairing these blades. So the numbers do really start to add up if you think that you've got four and a half thousand blades today in the UK operating that number's gonna double in the next three years. Um, and each one of those blades, um, if it becomes damaged, requires one, possibly two boats, and numerous people to repair it. So the whole scale of the industry is, is, is very large. And obviously, as it's largely out of sight, it's often out of people's minds as well. 
at the moment the projections are, and they are only projections, that the capacity will double in the next three years. That's fairly accurate because most of those projects are already uh, under construction um, and are not likely to, to change. Um, this figure is a bit more conjecture. Uh, in the UK, they're estimating we could be producing about 25 gigawatts of electricity uh, by 2030. That won't necessarily translate, as you're probably aware, into uh, a, a five-fold increase in the number of turbines because turbines are naturally getting bigger and bigger as the technology improves. Just to show you where we stand in Europe, um, and equally in the world, because Northern Europe is without a doubt the, the leader in offshore uh, wind. At the moment, this was in the Telegraph on Sunday, this article, um, the UK producing about 46% of, uh, of the electricity in, that comes from offshore wind in Europe is produced by the UK, Germany, Germany producing about 30%. And as far as we can see in the next 10 years, 20 years, that mix is probably going to stay about the same. Germany is certainly equally committed to offshore wind, uh, but the UK is so well suited to offshore wind, um, it will always stay ahead, as, as we can see at the moment, unless there are major political changes, um, that mix will probably stay fairly similar. The vessels in the industry are incredibly varied, like you'd expect in any marine civil engineering uh, project. The ones that have got sort of perhaps the most uh, press in the last few years are installation jack-up vessels. Uh, these enormous either six-leg or four-legged um, jack-up vessels that do the bulk of the, uh, of the, sort of the installation work. Um, if you're not familiar with the industry, basically there's, there's three components to an, an offshore wind turbine. You've got the monopile, which you can't see there, which will be driven in, in normally driven into the seabed by uh, a big heavy lift you know, vessel that's got uh, a hammer of some sort. Uh, then you have what we call the transition piece, the small yellow piece, which only extends sort of uh, not necessarily even as far as the seabed, um, which is grouted onto the top of the steel monopile. This is where a lot of the action happens. This is where the power cables come and go. Um, this is where the boat landing, where the crew, the technicians are going to come and go from. Um, it's also an area that's key in terms of corrosion. Um, so it's got a large number of anodes and it's often uh, the subject of paint renewal um, and secondary inspection. <coughs> Third part is from the top of the transition piece up to the top of the tower and that's actually the wind turbine itself and that's what you're in, the installation vessel will come along, um, put the tower and the cell and the blades on. What's changing radically at the moment, um, as the, and this is how the industry is reducing its costs, is that that combination of the generator or the nacelle at the top and the three blades is now actually being sent out as a pre-installed package. So you've actually got ships like this with three blades already attached to the hub um, lying in the horizontal. So the blades actually extending 20 odd meters out over the sides of the ship when it sails, three sets of blades stacked up on top of each other. If you can do all that in harbour, on a, you know, where wind is obviously going to be uh, less of a factor, you can go out and crane the whole lot on in one go and cut the time down. The, the, the process of putting a tower on with a generator and the three blades is now well under 24 hours. Um, so that, that can be a 14, 16 hour operation now to crane all that lot in, bolt it all down um, and begin the cable connection. Um, so an installation ship like that would certainly expect to fit three or four towers uh, in under three days and then be back to its base port to pick up another set. So the whole process is getting faster and faster. Also what you see a lot of on, the, uh, on, a, on any offshore wind farm are vessels which have moved across from the oil and gas sector. It's been very fortuitous that while the oil and gas sector has obviously been in a bit of a slump recently, there have been opportunities for uh, offshore service vessels, cable laying vessels, um, and general purpose ships um, that have been able to move across into the wind, offshore wind industry and carry on doing tasks that they're already familiar with. Uh, this ship is doing the, what we call the intra-array cables. You can imagine if you've got 100 turbines, every single one of those turbines has got to be connected either to another turbine by a cable and then from a turbine to the substation. 
So ships like this, many of you will be familiar with. I'm sure many of you have surveyed big ship surveyors who've surveyed either cable-laying vessels um, or offshore supply vessels that are now working in the wind farm sector. More unusual, again, perhaps the sort of uh, images that people don't think of in the general public. One of the biggest problems uh, in the turbine uh, offshore wind industry is scouring um, because these are often built in obviously in soft sediment um, environments where they can drive a monopile into the seabed. You've then got the, the follow on problem of, of the scouring around the base of the monopile uh, where it goes into the seabed. And there are a number of the early wind farms that didn't add enough of the scour protection in Denmark where they have got a distinct lean on some of their towers. They're not in danger of falling over, but they're certainly by no means upright anymore. So nowadays, commonly, um, either a, an inclined full pipe vessel like this uh, is going to drop uh, small diameter uh, stones or even a uh, side stone vessel, which is just going to push large rocks around the base of the turbine. And um, they might put anywhere from two to 4,000 tons of stone around every single uh, monopile on a site. So again, huge number of vessels, um, you know, moving a lot of equipment and, and, and uh, stores. These are the vessels that are becoming um, sort of the new uh, wonderkins on the, uh, on the wind farm, offshore wind farm scene. This is known as a walk to work vessel or a service operation vessel. The um, big difference here is we've actually got a way of getting from a ship to a turbine um, using a heave compensated um, ampleman. So there's actually a walkway between the ship. Now, of course, when you're using a jack up, you can park a jack up next to a ship, next to a turbine. Once it's jacked up and out of the water, you can put a gangway across. There's no need for any compensation. That can be a fixed structure. Traditionally, that's what's been done uh, when, a, when a jack up is working next to a turbine. But what we need going forward, either through the commissioning phase or in what we call the operations and maintenance phase, through the life of the, uh, the wind farm, you need to be able to get people on and off, electricians and engineers, to either service it or repair the unit over 25 years. So as wind farms go further and further offshore into rougher conditions, the use of the crew transfer vessels, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, is going to be limited. And these uh, service operation vessels are providing a possible alternative. They're, they're still largely untested um, technology. The idea is that a team of 24 or, or 48 uh, technicians would live on this ship and be out for, say, a two-week rotation. Um, and the ship would move around the site, dropping technicians off. The problem they have compared to the, the step to work traditional crew transfer vessels is the amount of time it takes them to set up. Obviously, they're dynamically positioned vessels um, and they've got to put a, a, a walkway across to the tower. It all has to be done in a very controlled environment. The whole point of using them is the idea they're going to work in rougher conditions than a crew transfer vessel can work in. Therefore, there are inherently greater risks. But certainly, as we go further offshore, these will become an important part um, of the arsenal for building and maintaining wind farms. Now, as I said, the area of my sort of interest it lies in crew transfer vessels. And this is, while we do consider ourselves quite humbly the minibuses of a wind farm with the, sort of the machinery to get people around, um, a few years, five, seven years ago, you would have considered them and compared them with a minibus. I think nowadays, uh, most crew transfer vessels are anything but a minibus. Uh, a vessel like this is over three million pounds. Um, and although it might only be crewed by uh, one or one skipper, or one mate, possibly an engineer, um, it's uh, still a very expensive bit of kit uh, with a very complex set of systems and quite a complex safety management system. They're used for everything from moving cargo around, getting stores out to uh, hotel ships that are based on site. Um, but traditionally, the idea was that they would move 12 passengers because that's what our original code was designed for. Um, and under the IMO regulations, as long as you've got 12 passengers or less, you're not a passenger vessel, um, so you can stay within some reasonable constraints in terms of the build and, and running of the vessel. But, as I say, they're often used for far more elaborate things, um, including moving equipment like this. Uh, that's cable protection um, system being moved on to the, the same cable laying ships or earlier. 
Uh, those are the actual sort of plastic sheaths that go on the, uh, the subsea cable as it runs into the bottom of the turbine to stop it chafing. So just to give you an idea of the, say, the crew transfer vessel uh, industry, and the rest of my presentation is going to be largely about crew transfer vessels, uh, but it doesn't matter whether you're a large ship, small craft surveyor, what your background is, auditor, um, there's a good chance that you will come into contact with this if you have anything to do with the offshore wind industry. At some point, you'll probably find yourself um, either surveying, auditing, inspecting um, a crew transfer vessel as they become more and more heavily regulated. Um, at the moment in Europe, there's about 400 crew transfer vessels. I say Europe because at the moment, the Chinese, Taiwanese, and American market is still very small. There's only literally a couple of crew transfer vessels in the US. They're of UK design. Um, they were built, obviously, the Jones Act. They were built in, in the US, uh, but to a, to a UK design um, that's been used and tried and tested in the, in the European market. So we've got about 400 crew transfer vessels. So, uh, you know, right there, you've got 400 vessels varying in price from probably about a million up to four or five million pounds um, capital cost. So it's, it's already quite a substantial investment for the small craft sector uh, to have got into. And a lot of different companies, both independent investors and large shipping companies are sort of moving into the, into the industry. Most of these are under 24 meters in length. That's been done obviously as an because of the restrictions of the number of passengers that can be carried, there was no point in going over the 24 metre um, load line length because of the extra regulation that would pose. As you'll see later on, there are now options to increase the passenger carrying capacity um, under the, underneath the new high speed uh, regulations. Many of these boats are built to class and it's an interesting point of contention this. Um, do they benefit from being built to class? I think those of us, and I work for a company that operates non-class vessels, uh, we'd obviously like to argue that there's no improvement in safety by building to class, um, but it's clearly a headline description that is attractive to some charters and to some big conglomerate, you know, multinationals, the likes of Siemens, the likes of Dong Energy, they hear the word class and there is an assumption that that vessel must be safer. Um, I'm not arguing there are some very good innovations that class has made through, through some of its uh, high-speed code, uh, but I would also say that if the, the new workboat code, the new MCA UK workboat code, if that had come about a couple of years earlier, we would probably actually prevented class getting, uh, not a stranglehold, but having so much influence in this sector. Uh, the new workboat code, any of you familiar with it, you'll know it's twice the length of the old one, and it's much more relevant to modern high-tech, high-speed uh, workboats. And as far as authorities such as the German um, and Danish authorities, I think if they'd had a copy of the new workboat code five years ago, they would have probably paid less, less attention to, to class in the industry. Interestingly, as we know UK flag, um, very popular in the, in the super yacht industry. Likewise, in the workboat sector, uh, there is a lot of attraction to the uh, nature, I wouldn't say simplicity, but the sort of clear cut um, nature of UK flag for the workboat code to the extent that some of the Dutch and German operators are actually using our flying UK flag and running their vessels under UK flag. Um, as you'll see later, that doesn't stop the problem of German port state, but uh, certainly from a flag point of view, the UK is, is far and away the dominant flag in this industry. The second would be the Danish. So most of our boats, they may have been built to class, but they are going to be coded uh, work boats to either the workboat code, an MGN 280, and obviously now the new workboat code. Um, that still finds itself in a somewhat of a transition phase. And when dealing with the MCA, you'll keep hearing them refer to the old code rather than the new code. Um, so what I would say is that virtually, well, all new builds in the UK, they all make sure that they adhere to the technical standard of the new workboat code, whether or not they get a new workboat code certificate. So the new workboat code is what it's all about. And there are some significant parts of that that were written almost post um, wind farm boom. Um, and it's, I think for, for everybody, the wind farm industry has had a positive influence 
on uh, improving the workload code without hampering existing workloads, um, as, this, as there are distinct sections um, that don't necessarily apply to others. As a surveyor, um, MLC is now anyone doing coding surveys will know that the MLC, the Maritime Labour Convention, is now very much a part of small craft world, seafarers, working conditions, um, the seafarers' employment agreements, all those elements, plus the standards and type of accommodation provided on board crew transfer vessels. Any of this is now covered by uh, the MLC. Um, since August 2013, obviously there were some delays. However, the MCA has recommended that we use the 2013 date rather than the later 2014 date, which is often banded around in the UK. This is probably the biggest change that's occurred between the old workboat code and the new workboat code is the carriage and transfer of cargoes. Um, so in the new workboat code, it's section 29, so it is sort of buried at the end a little, and yet as a crew transfer vessel operator on a wind farm, it is absolutely the most important part section in the whole of the code, um, because it's still, one, it still hasn't been ironed out completely, two, it is under great scrutiny by the charterers, the clients, um, and they're looking and sort of reviewing this section all the time because of the nature of some of the goods that we carry. So if you've surveyed a wind farm vessel, you may be familiar with this, that one of their roles, a crew transfer vessel, one of their other roles, which is a little unusual and somewhat counterintuitive, is transferring fuel, diesel fuel, from the vessel up to the turbine, onto the transition piece to run temporary generators. So while that turbine's being built and technicians need to be on it, servicing it, they need lights, they need dehumidifiers, they even need enough power to turn the turbine itself over if necessary, pump the hydraulics. Um, so to do that, we pump hundreds of thousands, if not millions of liters of fuel from crew transfer vessels up to, up to turbines. My, the company I work for, it's one of our specialties. Um, we have 18 meter boats that can carry 14,000 liters of diesel fuel, and it's not for the vessel itself. So probably getting on for 12,000 liters, that fuel is available for transfer up to towers. And we would expect to do that in a single shift. So we leave, leave board at six o'clock in the morning uh, with a group of technicians, full fuel tanks, go out to the first tower and spend half an hour pumping up a thousand liters or 2000 liters to a storage tank that's just sitting on top of that transition piece. And while the technicians check the generators running and that's providing sort of hundred KVA to the whole of that tower during its commissioning phase. So we've got a couple of inherent problems here. Then we've got the vessel carrying a huge amount of fuel for starters. Obviously that can be taken care of with the scantlings and during the build stage, but you've now got an external fuel transfer system. So you've got one or two either electric or hydraulic pumps and you're pumping fuel up to a tower that you're not actually attached to. So the vessel is simply pushed onto this tower and is transferring fuel. Understandably, the authorities, when they heard about this, because everyone had been doing it for about five years before anyone realised, um, were horrified. So all of a sudden, the MCA and rightly German authorities as well, particularly in the Baltic, thought, well, we, this is an environmental disaster um, waiting to happen. Now, I would say in terms of risk, um, we're only talking about diesel fuel here, and we are talking probably tens or hundreds of litres if it all went horribly wrong, as opposed to the potential with, uh, you know, what we're used to in terms of transporting petrochemicals around the world. This is a very relatively small risk, but it is a risk nonetheless. So the fuel transfer system is mentioned in the new workboat code, but because the MCA were very concerned when they started to hear more and more about what was going on on site, they added this very important, if you're a small craft surveyor, this is probably the most important document that's come out in the last um, year. Um, the surveyor's advice note number 75, um, which is available from the IIMS, was sent out from the IIMS that came out. Revision two, which came out in November of last year, um, goes into great detail, um, and indeed it will have some effect and change some of the new workboat code. It covers um, the carriage and transfer of cargo, so it carries traditional cargoes, so non-flammable, non-dangerous goods, um, it, such as the cable protection system we saw earlier, how that is carried and how it mustn't avoid affect the, uh, the vessel. It covers things like how we're carrying fuel. Is it in separate tanks? Is it in the ship's own tanks? 
uh, and it also covers all the risk assessment and other <coughs> procedures that must be in place before you can transfer fuel from your vessel to the tower. Now, that element, and this is where it all gets a bit confusing, that element is completely within the remit of certifying authority surveyor. So when you survey a vessel and you're doing an SCV2 or a workboat 2 on it, you would add that as an addendum to, the, to your, uh, your SCV2 as a separate uh, document. And the MTA has no problem with that as long as you follow the SAM 75. You would have thought that at the same time they'd have included that, but they didn't. So the MTA has decided that dangerous goods, because there's no exemption, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, any dangerous goods on any vessel uh, must meet the IMDG code. Um, in our case, it's normally small packaged dangerous goods, but they still need a document of compliance from the MCA. That can't be issued by a certifying authority surveyor. So they, the two things tend to happen fairly close together nowadays, um, but uh, they are done by a separate party, um, unless you're using the MCA to also be your certifying authority and code the vessel. So that's a new sort of a new element that's been added to the certifying authority surveyor's remit. In addition to that, so we've we've coded the vessel, we've got its cargo covered. Um, we've now got an alternative, which is going to be somewhat of a game changer for the small vessels, which is the new high-speed um, OSC, which gives our vessels the ability under 24 meters to carry more than 12 passengers. But there's a, there is a caveat with that. They must be designated as industrial personnel. It's not just um, Joe Bloggs going for a ride out to the wind farm. These are people who are trained, um, have done sea survival, medically fit, etc. So that's an add-on normally, as we'll see in a minute, to our existing. And at the moment, it's still under the remit of the MCA. And finally, as I said, um, you may decide also when building a new workboat to have it class or build it to class under either Lloyd's DNV BV um, using one of those rules. So what's it done to do the UK? Well I'd say um, anyone who's been at Sea Work, um, anyone who's at Sea Work in 2007-2008 um, probably had seen a bit of a decline particularly in the workboat sector in the UK. I would say the wind farm industry um, has been you know largely responsible for re rejuvenating both alloy and GERP, FRP production vessels in the, in the UK. Um, not only that, a lot of the designs are done here, so even the vessels that are built in Singapore and Australia um, are still being designed in the UK. So there's a huge amount of intellectual property that's being developed in the UK for the wind farm sector. Uh, that's a boat being built um, at sea truck boats. Um, resin infused, so it's a composite vessel, but being built to you know, high standards of um, production. Um, and keeping weight down by building it uh, using a resin infusion technique rather than a wet layer. So, so a lot of expertise um, and a say input to the uh, UK boat building scene. On the machinery side, um, we've seen a lot of advances, perhaps too far, I would argue. Um, uh, this is on a modern aluminium wind farm vessel. That's a V12, uh, 2000 horsepower engine. There's two of those, obviously. Um, and you know that's the sort of standard machinery in a 24 meter load line length vessel nowadays giving you 30 knots um, and somewhere between 10 and 12 uh, tons of bollard pull which is very important when you're pushed onto that tower. So we've got complex uh, machinery spaces, uh, we've got modern building techniques both alloy and uh, uh, composite. We've got cargo of all sorts being transported on these vessels. Um, that's not an unusual sight, and nowadays with bigger boats, um, even that's a 10 foot container, but 20 foot containers are not unusual. Um, and on the stern, on the aft deck, certainly two or three 20 foot containers is not unusual on a modern crew transfer vessel. Um, I highlighted that one. Um, the, the sea cat boats have the, they do have the advantage of having a very high bridge, but still when we had that con container on deck, um, we ended up actually having to fit a CCTV camera onto the front of the container because when you're actually approaching the tower to push on, just at the critical moment when you're about to hit the tower, um, you'd lose sight completely of what was going on. So uh, 
while it wasn't a problem when you're at sea for normal passage making, it certainly was for manoeuvring the boat uh, near a tower. Sand 75 uh, covers that in great detail because they've obviously uh, been made aware of some of these issues and some of the cargo being carried on crew transfers. Also um, on their usual site on a modern crew transfer vessel uh, is a knuckle boom or high app type crane. Most of them have it. So again, it's added another level of complexity. Uh, while most of these boats are catamarans, stability is, I wouldn't say not an issue, less of an issue um, to a monohull in terms of loading. Um, still, it gives the complication of, uh, of the installation of that crane uh, when surveying. This is the same vessel, it's, it's crane on that, on that particular boat. Um, you can imagine you're doing 30 knots into short, steep seas. Um, all of these holding down bolts, everything's experiencing quite unusual loads, nothing to do with its usual operation as a crane, but just its life on a, on a high-speed vessel. We've got exposed hydraulic um, pipe work hoses. Um, that boat will also have a hydraulically driven fire pump, hydraulically driven pressure, uh, high-pressure hose, maybe a hydraulic fuel uh, transfer pump. So the, the complexity of these boats is, is getting greater and greater and certainly no sign of slowing down. Just to go back to the fuel transfer um, for one second on this photograph. That SAN 75, which again, this is under a certified authority um, remit. So it's quite an important section. The, the key element in, in this system, it's a very simple system. You've usually got a inch and a quarter, an inch and a half hose that's running up the tower, maybe up to 60 meters long. If you're working in the Irish Sea, you've got 10 meter tides, um, you've got to get that hose all the way up to the tower to, to fill up a temporary generator. Technician's gone up there, he's lowered a crane down with a davit, uh, on the davit crane with a hook to lift the hose up. All important is this dry brake coupling. So the manufacturer will tell you that that shouldn't lose more than literally less than 100 mil of fuel um, if it's to break. It's rated to break at 500 kilos, so everything else around it obviously has to be considerably more than 500 kilo um, working load. Um, and so that is a key part of the inspection area on any vessel that's doing fuel transfer. I have seen, not in my role as a surveyor, but my role as a vessel operator, um, I have seen that uh, dry brake coupling at the top of the tower, 50, 40 meters up, right next to the guy who's holding the nozzle, still attached to the davit crane, so that if the boat had <clears throat> lost power or been knocked off the turbine uh, by a wave, poor unsuspecting deckhand would have got 50 odd meters of hose plus half of a steel dry brake coupling coming back down at it. So needless to say, there are some huge oversights that occur in the industry, um, and rightly so that the MCA decided that they wanted to get more involved in, in seeing how this was uh, being installed. So it's an area. The, it's not particularly onerous. We have all our vessels um, have um, an addendum to, carry, to, to do fuel transfer. Uh, we're talking about risk assessments, formal procedure, um, ship oil pollution um, plan, a uh, couple of additional fire extinguishers outside, which are a dangerous goods requirement anyway. Two fire hoses rather than one fire hose for plentiful supply of water. Do they have a Bravo flag? Do they have a way of hoisting a Bravo flag? Lots of work folks don't. Uh, an all-round red, because we're often refueling at night. Um, and a, a key one that's been added quite recently, um, all fuel transfer systems must have an emergency stop at the helm, not just on the deck. So that the assumption being that there will be somebody sitting at the helm, whereas there might not be somebody on deck. Is that um, certified? Yes, it is. And is it also in the... Right, so that's an LFX coupling. So they're the same company that makes them for petrol forecourts. That's sort of their bread and butter. Now, they, they produce a certificate of conformity when it's shipped to you with them rated at five kilonewtons, 500 kilograms roughly, um, braking strength. And all they are are um, bolts, four bolts or six bolts, depending on the system, that have basically been reduced in diameter at their midpoint. So, Service interval on that is really going to be risk assessed based on how much you're using it. Has, has it been, if it, for example, if it's been knocked, and um, we have not on our vessel, but I'm aware of one where it was dropped from sort of a meter or so onto a hard deck um, and the unit actually snapped because it landed one side down. 
they are inherently safe in the sense that when they go, um, you, the, the way that they're set up internally, the valves shut automatically. So if it was to fail, it would be more of an operational headache than it would be from a safety headache. Um, but yeah, ours, ours are reset, depending on how much they're being used, um, annually send them back and have the bolts um, replaced. Another thing which, certainly in my time as a small craft, not say not a big ship world, but a small craft surveyor, I'm not used to all of your bollards and strong points having to be rated, having to be displayed that they're rated. Um, this was driven, this was a sort of a top-down, customer-driven um, in, input. Uh, Dong Energy, I think I'm not blaming Dong Energy for anything, they've probably been responsible for raising the game, everybody's game in the industry. Um, that appeared a couple of years ago as a requirement that all bollards should be marked. And their logic was, understandably, a lot of wind farm vessels end up towing other wind farm vessels in. So they wanted to see strong points marked, what their rating, their safe working load was. And also, another thing which from small craft side of things you wouldn't expect to do, um, all mooring lines, all towing lines, all bridles have to be certified. Um, as to what their working load is and what their braking strain is. So obviously the line is going to break before the, uh, the bollard gives way. Again, not stuff that's unusual to a ship surveyor, but stuff that is unusual to a small craft surveyor. Uh, I say, this is where I see the two in sort of uh, sectors uh, moving together. So you've coded your vessel under UK rules. Um, you've got your workboat code. You have or haven't got class. You've got your um, fuel transfer, you've got your dangerous goods document compliance, and you're starting to sort of get this boat ready to go to work. However, <clears throat> some other options. So most of the modern 24 load line length, and bear in mind some of these boats are 27, 28 meters um, overall, uh, extreme length, but 24 meters on the load line. Um, this new option of looking at high speed offshore service craft code now the Germans got one up on us here because this is a quite a competitive industry between the, the German industry and the UK industry. The UK was without a doubt the leader back in early 2000s, wind farms, um, and we were sending out all sorts of work boats with tractor tires on the front, ever anything that would float that could get a person out to a turbine. However, the Germans saw, particularly in their market where they were going to be working further offshore, they wanted to find a way of getting more than 12 passengers out to those towers, but still using sub 24 meter vessels. So almost simultaneously, but, but let's say the German authority, uh, probably about six months ahead of us, uh, came up with this new offshore service craft code. It's an extension of a special purpose ships code, which again, any of you who've worked in oil and gas will know that's how you can transport more than 12 industrial personnel on a ship when you're working at sea cable laying ships, pipe laying ships, um, carry, already carry more than 12 passengers because they are industrial personnel, they're all trained, um, they've all got sea survival, medical fitness, that sort of thing. So this was an extension of that, and it was written absolutely just with the wind farm industry in mind, although it could be extrapolated and used elsewhere. So you've got 24 meter load line length. The term is suitably equipped, and that will include things such as your emergency evacuation system, your seating, provision, um, whether it's seat belts or forward facing suspension seats, that sort of thing. Not necessarily, uh, I would add that nowadays as these boats have got bigger, there has been a bit of a move away from suspension seats because the size of the boats just doesn't really uh, require it to avoid core body vibration. So in, technically speaking, you can carry 36 industrial personnel or you could carry 24 industrial personnel and 12 passengers, so you are allowed to combine the two. The reality is nobody yet has tried getting 36 persons on a 24, sub 24 meter boat because you would give up all your sort of cargo carrying capacity and deck space. So the, the most likely is the 24 seat um, version, which is what SeaCat's latest boat, I think it's uh, one of the Dolby boats, so the UK boats are already doing it um, and putting 24 seats in. At the moment, many other boats are being built and coded for the high speed code, um, but they're not actually installing the seats, so they're keeping the space clear inside the, uh, the wheelhouse. 
The interesting twist here is you don't, it's not a sudden move away from the workload code because the high speed code gives you a permit to operate in a particular area. So you might designate a particular port, perhaps it's Wilhelmshaven out to Helgoland and Helgoland out to an offshore wind farm in Germany, um, or perhaps it's from uh, Ramsgate out to the London Array in the Thames Estuary, and that's your permit to operate with your 24 industrial personnel. If you then want to suddenly move, which obviously a lot of these things happen at short notice, if you suddenly need that boat working in Amsterdam or working in the Baltic, you can't relocate that vessel without applying for another permit to work. The easiest way to relocate that vessel is coded under the usual UK flag workboat code. Ask your industrial personnel to get off at this point, obviously, because um, you're now back to being a 12 passenger workboat and you can then move that boat around any way you like without getting without any permit to operate on that route. So the relocation element is quite important because you still need both codes, you need the workboat code and that. Um, I have this presentation has got uh, the links to those, uh, both the code and the uh, special purpose ships um, as well. So any boat that's built for the high speed offshore service craft code will be built to class, that is a requirement. So, and the MCA at the moment are the responsible authority for issuing uh, a high speed craft offshore service code. Okay, so being an international business, um, we're still not there yet because now our UK work boat uh, needs to work elsewhere. Again, my background was in sailing boats originally. I'm used to being able to, so even commercial boats, we used to be able to sail over the channel. Nobody in France or Belgium has ever sort of questioned, uh, you know, what code your vessel's operating under, what qualifications your crew got, or anything like that. The wind farm industry being obviously a, a high sort of profile industry has drawn a lot of attention to work boats um, working outside their, their flag state. So when we go to the likes of Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark and Finland, um, absolutely no problem at all. These countries have the, the reciprocal arrangement, and it's not a formal reciprocal arrangement, it's an unspoken arrangement where these countries have thought, well, we're going to do as well out of this as the Brits are going to do out of this, so let's make this very easy and all recognise each other's codes, recognise each other's qualifications. Um, and so we found in general that these port states, the UK workboat code is well known, um, it's recognised as it is. The UK minimum safe manning is also largely accepted. Um, yacht masters, for example, are still valid as masters of these uh, vessels, although the charter may not agree with that. The country uh, certainly recognises the minimum safe manning levels. As I said, they're sort of almost reciprocal. We see a lot of those boats working in the UK. There's never any problem. They come and go as they please. The, the, the somewhat more complex picture is in Germany. And of course, as Germany represents the second biggest uh, player in the wind farm industry, um, this has caused us quite a bit of pain, particularly recently, if you may be aware of what's happened since Easter this year, where the Germans, rightly so, they, this certificate of equivalence has been in place for many, many years. Um, they just decided to actually start enforcing it to the letter of the law uh, since April, and that's caused a few operators um, some pain. So any commercial vessel that's working in coastal, that's on a coastal voyage in German waters needs to have this certificate of equivalence. And this applies to everything from small work boats to large ships. The gray area is when you are on a coastal voyage versus just a passage or transiting through their waters. Um, we find our vessels that are going to Finland from the UK, if they stop in a German port, Nobody even raises an eyebrow, you don't even get a visit from the port police. But once that vessel is operating from a German port, we expect a port state inspection within sort of days uh, or hours, uh, depending on how much of a heads up they have that you're coming. So, so the, again, it's not an overly complex um, problem, it's just knowing what you need to do. EACs, again, big ship people will be very familiar with this, any engine that produces over 100 um, 100 kilowatts should be provided with an engine international air pollution prevention certificate. Um, in fact, it was a bit of a surprise to myself and a few colleagues that um, this, this has existed under UK law for many years. Um, it's part of the merchant shipping regulations, it's part of MGM 280 by 
because it's in the merchant shipping regulations, a new, a new build workboat in the UK should come with EAPs included as part of your contractual agreement with the, the builder. You can't actually supply a, a UK workboat without supplying those, a new build. Um, but when you talk to people, you'll find an awful lot of people have got workboats and they've not received um, EAPs. We've got uh, 14 identical Cummins engines in seven vessels, and we pay near on a thousand pounds for every single EAP, and I can tell you they are just somebody's just putting them on photocopy in Houston. Um, and we've now got 14 copies at a cost of 14,000 uh, pounds, because a lot of ours slipped through. I think the last couple were included by the manufacturer, but a lot of builders have been sloppy um, at supplying them, and it's a lot more expensive getting them from an engine manufacturer once the engine has left the, uh, the, the bill, the, man, the uh, plan. So keep an eye out that any workboat you're dealing with should have those on board. UK safe manning is not recognised, so one, you need to have an actual uh, safe manning document. You can't just refer to, as we used to, we used to just say, well, if you look at the workboat code, it says what the safe manning levels are. That's not accepted. You actually have to have an MCA issued safe manning document like a ship would have. Um, and the UK workboat levels, crew competency levels, are not recognised. The master now, as of, as I say, this has always been there, but as of April this year, is now being enforced. The master of this sub-24 metre, or in our case, sub-19 metre boat, must hold at least a master 3,000 um, with an unlimited area, uh, or a master mariner. So we have inevitably drawn on some Master 3000s from the UK. We also use some Danish Masters who have an equivalent. Um, so we've had to do CECs for, for those Danish Masters to work on our boats. Um, the problem with that, as you can imagine, uh, very rapidly, there was, uh, there was probably about 50 UK work boats working in Germany at the time, who all overnight had to find, because it did come in overnight, had to find, so there were Master 3000s rapidly put in their pay demands up over Easter weekend. The mate, again, as you'll know, anyone in the workboat sector, mates or, or crew on a workboat only need to have up to sort of uh, two waters, only need to be uh, competent, uh, as deemed by the master or the skipper. Um, in German waters, he has to hold the navigational watch rating as a minimum. So again, not an overly onerous requirement, but it's something more paperwork to, to acquire. The, to qualify for this certificate of equivalency, the vessel must have either, now again, this isn't a problem for a class vessel, um, if not because it would have an annual class radio survey anyway, uh, but if you're a non-class vessel, you are going to need some form of annual radio, uh, some sort of authority, it's called verification, but basically a light class radio survey is required for any workboat working in German waters. That can be issued by the certifying authority. Um, it doesn't have to be a class radio survey if the vessel is not. Class. Uh, well, <laughs> very little in some cases, but it is improving. That is literally saying there's a there's two VHFs on the boat. There's a beeper. There's a SART writing down a whole list and then sort of expanding to make it look grander. I personally think that's a bit of a false economy because sooner or later. As you'll see in a minute, one of your customers is going to say, can I see your EPIRB test certificate for this year? Or your radio test certificate. So going down the cheap and cheerful route of getting your CA surveyor to do it while he's doing his annual inspection is probably a bit of a false economy. But it, it will meet the requirements of the German authorities. It, and it is literally just a list of the equipment on board to say that it meets minimum GMDSS standards for the operating area. Uh, what we're doing now is we are getting our equipment, even though they're non-class vessels, we get them done by a class radio surveyor, just so that we can say that we've got a test report for radio output and uh, performance and that sort of thing. Just an example, other things to consider, again, you're working as a, as a consultant, hopefully, or as a, you know, a, a, an interested party, not just as a surveyor with your, uh, with your, your customer. Um, sewage certificates very gray area, they're required for vessels that carry more than 15 persons, i.e. 16 upwards, um, whereas garbage plans are fifth up anything above 15 or more. So 
A small craft will generally not use a, need a sewage certificate because it's only got 12 passengers and possibly three crew, but it will often need a garbage plan. And it's one of the favorite uh, port police inspections um, is to ask for your garbage plan. And that is quite a lengthy document and needs preparing, but there are IMO templates for that sort of thing. So again, you begin to see there's an awful lot of paperwork here for a small workload. Fire and safety plan is required. Well, you would hope you'd have one of those anyway. Um, what came to light with that is another small tweak is that on the one hand, if you look up the definition of industrial personnel, the IMO expects all these industrial personnel to be carrying things such as immersion suits, and that's verbatim what the IMO says. However, the German authorities say the vessel must carry immersion suits for all persons on board, passengers, industrial personnel, and crew. So you do end up with- uh, Regardless of so it's Regardless, yes. Uh, and obviously that's an interesting area and something which we can discuss in more detail another time is what type of immersion suit, because you get to the point you can't be using, you know, eight mil neoprene suits on a 17, 16, 17 meter work, but you wouldn't have enough room to store them all. Um, so we've looked at non-insulated because we can argue that as long as we're below, I think it's 60, uh, there's a one that's valid up to about 60 odd degrees north, provided the passengers are wearing um, warm clothing. So there's, there's, uh, there's ways around some of that to keep it realistic. So finally, you've done all that, you've, you've got your boat operating in Germany. Now, um, the one you've heard lots about recently, particularly with the IMS involvement, is the, the IMCA. Um, and this is almost the, <laughs> after you've done all that work, the only document, the, your charter, um, is actually going to read is probably going to be the IMCA 189, uh, which, as we know, has traditionally been a bit of a bit of a tick box exercise, uh, but hopefully um, is is moving into sort of a, a better stage in its life now and become a more valid and more useful document, uh, particularly as it goes into its new electronic format. So this is often done by the same surveyor who's doing your um, intermediate or annual survey or your initial survey. So. It's basically an audit. Um, so that's why the charter is like it, because it's a final wrap up that everything else that's come before it has been done um, and, and is valid. Everything's in date, whether it's insurance, life for <laughs> firefighting equipment, it's all there. But it does require a good knowledge of regulations. Our biggest gripe, if I can say from a vessel operator's point of view, is there is a box that says yes, no, or not applicable. It's too darn tempting for people to put no when it means they don't understand the regulations. So does the vessel have a, um, a radio logbook? The answer is no. Well, you've now caused all the tiny sub 25 gross ton vessels who've got no need to carry either an official logbook or a radio logbook. You've now just, by ticking the, by ticking the no box, those vessels now are gonna to have to argue their case because they've now got something which is gonna flag up the red flag to the customer um, and they're going to have to explain it. So you need to know the regulations but what I would argue, what I'd say is the most important thing is to have a discussion and the IMCA very clearly points this out that the surveyor should talk to either the, mess, the, the master or the vessel operator during the survey because our biggest problem has been is we will try and have a conversation with a surveyor um, and we get a lot of large ship surveyors from particularly from Germany and Denmark who fly into the UK to do it because on behalf of our clients um, and we'll be told we need a, a sewage certificate when we know we don't need a sewage certificate when we've got a vessel work boat certificate that says the boat can't carry more than 15 but they don't want to listen to that because in their mind it's a ship it, it's going to Germany so I just, but it, it took my, the master who was on board, this last one that was not that long ago with the sewage issue, he pulled up the IMO regulations within seconds, the actual page on the IMO website where it defines, because the, this surveyor wasn't going to believe it, that it was more than 15 passengers, not 15 or more. Um, and it was just about having that discussion. And say, I think as a surveyor, I'd like to think that you're working with your vessel operator um, even if you're an independent auditor, you're not trying to fail the boat, you're trying to get the boat into a state that it will meet the client's requirements. So it's in everybody's interest um, to sort of have that discussion and hopefully um, that can be put to bed uh, before all the red, red marks go off to the uh, customer. 
And I would say the most important thing is discuss the safety management system. Um, and that's probably, a, again, a new area uh, to a lot of small craft surveyors is the whole nature of safety management systems. Most uh, wind farm crew transfer vessel operators are now operating full-blown audited IS, ISM systems. Um, so the master, the crew, they should be familiar with that. They should know where to go and look up um, things. They should know what, you know, where their drill reports, you know, what, what was their last drill? They should have written a drill report. Um, so by discussing that during the MK, you get a real feel for how that boat's being run. And believe it or not, there can still be this final survey. So you've done all that, and then you show up on site, and the very particular clients also have, and this is an area of, of real opportunity for independent surveyors. Um, I know some of our members are already involved in this side of things, working for a wind farm uh, operator, actually performing independent on hire or in surveys as they call them. Um, and this is basically to check that the vessel's got all the documentation on board, um, the crew have been inducted on the site, they're familiar with the site, and it's the final sort of, you know, welcome package, effectively. Um, it should be painless, um, but it can require some additional safety equipment, but hopefully you would have known that in advance. The G plus you'll hear people talking about, that is the group of, uh, there were nine, there's no more than nine uh, members, the likes of Vestas, Siemens, Gong Energy, Scottish Power, SSE. They've now formed a, con a consortium try and standardize um, their audits and their standards across wind farms as to what they expect. But luckily, and I think I'm hopeful that with the improvement with the, the electronic version of CMID, it will begin to negate the need for the final in-survey. We'd like to think if you've done the CMID, you've had everything checked, um, you can then rock up and work. Am I okay for a couple more minutes? Have we got? Yeah, two minutes. Right, okay, I'll just wrap it up. So I just want to flick through a few photos. Obviously, surveying, I don't need to teach you how to survey vessels. I'm just going to highlight a few areas of uh, wind farm vessels that are of interest that might not have crossed your mind before. It's all about the fenders. Um, it's all about one, it's all, basically it's all about the front and the back. It's what's pushing the boat and, and how it's sticking onto that tower in front of it if you're a crew transfer vessel. So just look at some. So there is a typical fender system on a 24 meter um, vessel. Uh, you're looking at somewhere in the region of about 50,000 pounds worth of rubber on the front of that boat, uh, and probably 10 to 15,000 pounds of it will be replaced at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, um, if it's doing a lot of work. Obviously, that's what we do in crew transfers. We're pushing onto a tower. People are going up and down. That rubber needs to stick effectively, like a good car tire, onto those boat landings um, and predictably move. It's going to move, obviously, but predictably move, and that requires reasonable sort of technology in terms of rubber. It also requires good crew, and uh, as I say, I think that's probably more when you look at the accident um, information and data. Um, crew training, as well as fender design, are the two key elements there. The crew member who's standing to the right there has got to manage that entire maneuver because um, this is where he's stepping off a moving object obviously onto a fixed object um, and often there is a safety line involved that can cause some problems. That's the bow on a typical GRP boat, um, the structure behind. We find less problems in the bow areas on GRP boats than aluminium boats, not surprisingly. Alley, particularly along the wells, um, needs to be, the scantlings need to be sized Appropriately. I just happened to see that uh, I was in Germany a couple of weeks ago and that was on, that's about £25,000 worth of bow fender about to be replaced on the front of a British boat. Um, that weighs somewhere between five and 600 kilograms um, and that is just the middle bit. Um, the tower, the push on landing will just be on the, where the white piece of paper is up in one of the boat landings um, and that will get bolted on. Luckily, you've usually got crane obviously on board the boat itself, you can often lift them into place yourself and do the work yourself without requiring outside assistance. But These are still around, uh, traditional defenders, um, but they are being phased out because of the amount of metal work that's involved with them, often involves the uh, towers being scratched. So a lot of customers are now saying it has to be what we call cushion vendors and no more defenders. So you will still see them on a lot of uh, 
So just a quick thing, if I could just say on this side of things, we as an operator, and I say I think as surveyors, we're moving this way as well, um, surveying on complex boats, it has to be risk-based. You can't check every single thing on the boat. It's impossible. You haven't got enough time to do that. So if our objectives are to ensure safety at sea, that's the, from the ISM code, um, we need to highlight and, and focus in on um, the areas of risk. And I just want to highlight the five incidents. Again, there's links to all these. You'll be familiar with probably two, three, or even four of these. Um, the first two happened on the same day in November. Classic human error, whether it was fatigue, whether it was competency or performance. You can read the MAIB reports for your own uh, sort of digestion. Um, two boats that both suffered collisions. Wingcat 9 hit a, um, a target buoy. Uh, in, on the, off the east coast as it's returned to Grimsby, at doing 23 knots with 12 passengers on board, I think, at the time. Um, luckily, being a catamaran, it didn't sink, but it certainly suffered significant damage. Island Panther actually ran into a tower on, on the wind farm. Again, to me, they are all, and I say all of us as operators have suffered some form of grounding or incident of that nature. Um, largely, they are human errors but why, or why they've occurred is, is a much more complex thing. Um, in January 2014, there was a fire on the Topaz, and more recently, December of 2015, you may be familiar with this vessel, um, the Uma Ventus. She's a, I'll just flip through these with a push of time. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. That's the Uma Ventus. Again, a very high-tech ship. She's a surface effect ship. Her sister ship's working in Sassanitz in the Baltic at the moment, next to one of our boats. Um, they kept sort of persisting with the design. It's an amazing concept. It's a lift vessel. It to lifts itself about a meter um, when it gets underway. It has two enormous fan units that are driving air down into the skirt. Um, and it was in those fan unit areas that the fire began. Um, and if you read the Danish report, which I'll put a link to on there, it's, it reads frighteningly similar to the report here which was from the Topaz, which was a GRP boat that sank off Lowestoft two years ago, which had a fire over its Eberspacher heater. And again, both of these incidents highlighted a lack of fire detection, a lack of fire suppression systems, because they weren't in traditional machinery spaces. And at the moment, the brown code um, is woefully um, light on fire suppression and fire detection. So, to us, it's all about the two elements I think are most important as a, as a vessel operator, which hopefully would coincide with what surveyors would see, is you've got to select the right crew because it, you've got a high performance vessel traveling at night often, traveling at high speeds with 12, possibly 24 passengers on board in very difficult conditions with a lot of commercial pressures. So half your accidents or more right there are going to be because you pushed some poor skipper to his absolute limit in his 12 hour or 14 hour day. The other area, perhaps as surveyors, we can do more about, which is designing out and improving fault detection. The Topaz, and particularly the Uma Ventus um, incident, were completely avoidable if they'd had better fire detection. And in the Uma Ventus, it was completely uh, lacking in fire suppression systems, these two enormous motors that, that provide the fan lift. Uh, they had no way of putting that lot out. Um, and this, using the term a machinery space and saying that a machinery space is only the engine room, um, you know, is, is madness. Um, I worked on an aluminium class, aluminium vessel that had a generator, all the domestic batteries, all the inverter batteries, and two fuel tanks all in the same space. There was a fire detection system in there, uh, but there was no fire suppression system, and that was built to, to class. So it's not just the, it's not just the workboat code class as well is lacking in a in a sensible interpretation of what represents fire. We believe that CCTV is one of your best all round tools, and we've spent a lot of time and money adding more and more cameras around our boat because that's the fastest way for a master to to react um, and know whether what he's listening to in the alarm uh, is real or just another one of those many alarms that we all know goes on. So we're in a strong position in the UK, both as operators, surveyors, our internet intellectual property built up in the UK and the industry is enormous, and there is potential worldwide now. We're seeing a lot of boat operators move out to Taiwan as 
wind farms start there. And unfortunately, uh, however you voted, the post-Brexit weak pound is making our vessels and our uh, intellect even cheaper to buy. So there's a, a, a greater resurgence. But what will come now, after this, as what we heard yesterday, is billions of euros of more investment um, in the UK. Just to finish on, that was uh, on Sunday afternoon. Um, I just grabbed that off a very interesting website. It's the actual Crown Estate <coughs> website. It gives you a live update on how much electricity is being produced in the UK by offshore wind. Um, <coughs> that was on, set on Sunday afternoon. 14% uh, of the UK's electricity has been generated. And you can see that's the current location. Um, and it's likely to remain in a similar mix going forward, except we're gonna see more and more wind farms out in the North Sea off the likes of Whitby and places. Um, Dogger Bank, obviously, is one that's uh, been in the news. But, as I say, the boats go everywhere. We, this year we've been working as far afield as Finland, uh, which means we either use some local surveyors, but when we can, we actually use our UK surveyors um, and send them over there because they know the boats. And, of course, you're working further and further afield. You've got annual surveys and intermediate surveys that need to take place um, elsewhere. So there's a lot of opportunities for... UK vessel operators and you know UK surveyors to make use of what's been learned in these past few years. That is it. Yeah. Sorry to overrun there. Well, that's Thank you. An absolutely fascinating um, run through of the industry. If anybody's interested in the seaweed um, vessel inspector um, program, do let me know.